Hello everyone, my name is Mick Kirst. I'm the founder and CEO of TaskUp and the author of Project the Product. And I'm thrilled to be coming to you from Vancouver and speaking at the DevOps Loop conference. So I've been working in helping organizations, especially large organizations, adopt the practices of DevOps, but really think about DevOps from end to end, how we deliver customer value, how we structure organizations, where our bottlenecks are in terms of automation, and fundamentally how we drive better business outcomes with DevOps. The challenge I think a lot of our organizations have seen over the years is uh, we've got all these great initiatives to make development move faster, but the DevOps practices have maybe not scaled the way we expected them to. There's not enough uh, ownership in the teams or autonomy able to drive outcomes faster, and so we're just not getting the kind of scaling that we expected. And even more frustratingly to the teams, uh, while we might have very agile teams, uh, they're heavyweight processes both downstream and upstream of those development teams. And of course, this results in slower velocity, much longer time to value in terms of what we deliver, and a lot of frustration uh, across our teams. While all of these great practices around bringing code to cloud, scaling, and actually being able to deliver have already been mastered across so many organizations. So really the question is, how can we make sure that our organization can innovate at the space and really perform at the pace of a software company, apply these DevOps practices in the large, not just in automating the pipeline, but in making sure that we can deliver value to customers more quickly. And so to do that, we actually need to understand where, where the bottleneck is. Is the bottleneck that we have today in, in, uh, where we're deploying code? Uh, is it, we, have we actually trained people on our approach to hybrid cloud or to cloud technologies? Do we have the right kind of pipeline automation in place? And fundamentally, where's our bottleneck? Where does value slow down? Where are developers getting frustrated? Uh, where are we having most of our incidents come from? And we've had this long history of metrics. Uh, this is a, a, I wrote an article with Nicole Forsgren on DevOps metrics and how we can really think about measuring the flow of value across our value streams to understand, are we accelerating our ability to innovate? Are we making it easier for teams to work faster, uh, to work more autonomously, to be aligned to business outcomes, or are we not? And one of the main goals of, of the Project to Product book is to help us understand how we can better measure these end-to-end -end flows. So not just measure a small portion of the value stream, not go to the point where we're moving fast in, in this one spot, as you saw in, in the, that previous slide, where things are moving fast for in the creation aspect, people are able to close user search quickly, but how can we actually optimize end-to-end -to -end and get value to our customers faster? Where are those traffic jams on, on the road? And what we're seeing across the industry, especially in large organizations, also just some data that we've collected across our customers' value streams is that these constraints are actually unmeasured. And so while we might be doing a lot in terms of our, our journey to cloud, uh, our journey to modernizing our infrastructure, if we don't actually identify and address these constraints, a lot of that was not being leveraged. So I'll show you some statistics. These are, you know, the first time I saw these, they certainly startled me. But what we're seeing across large enterprises is that 8% of what's planned by agile teams gets delivered. So we've got this really significant effort in, in planning and structuring the, the work that we're doing, but it's just getting clogged. The, that work is getting stuck in these value streams. This one's even worse. 20% of features are canceled after code's been written. So think about how, well, and a lot of us know how demotivating this is to us, to our teams, but if we're basically have, the, if it is, have these disconnects in our value streams where planning is happening out of step in how we actually think about deploying and delivering value, uh, we're starting work and 20% of that work is actually not ever making it to the customer because it's canceled by the business side, by, by product management or something similar because we've got, again, these, these disconnected value stream. 35% of products have zero capacity for new work. So we've got completely overloaded teams and value streams. And we're not realizing that when the planning is happening. And of course, that's actually exacerbating that canceled work. The fact that when you're overloaded, you can't take on new work, business or customer priorities change, the work gets canceled, and we have all these massive inefficiencies. 85% of products underinvest in security and debt. And this is, of course, making it harder to get work done faster. It means automation initiatives, uh, DevOps initiatives deployment improvements, uh, infrastructure improvements, uh, adoption of, of new services are all falling behind because there's a constant underinvestment in this. And 95% of value streams do not know what their flow efficiency is. So they understand where those bottlenecks are at a systemic level. So fundamentally, how can we make this easier for our teams to get this kind of work done, to apply the principle of DevOps, but to do this really end to end, to make sure that we're not just focusing on a small subset of our value stream and code commit to code deploy, but we're really focusing end to end to understand where, how can we accelerate the, the, the flow of value? What dependencies, what architectural problems, what organizational structures are actually impeding that? So 
I think the really great thing that I've, I've been able to see uh, in the past few years as the concepts of project to product have been adopted is that they've been driving change, where organizations are, are starting to think differently around architecture, where uh, software architecture is not just around having the, these perfect layer diagrams that look great on slides, but really decoupling our value streams just to accelerate flow end to end. And where architecture really, the role of architecture becomes accelerating flow for every one of those uh, and teams that should be functioning as independently as possible, and of course for their dependencies to be as minimal and cons as, as possible as well. Automation, again, a lot of organizations where they're starting is, is with their bottlenecks being in the pipeline, being in the, in, in the area of, of deploying, automating, uh, uh, managing the releases, and, and, and automation of, of getting, getting code to cloud, getting code, code into our uh, infrastructure and modernizing the infrastructure. So we're seeing that. The shift from project to product has highlighted that because all of a sudden you're looking at every product's value stream's velocity, seeing those big, big impediments, and investing there. Budgeting, of course, changes. So you look at funding value streams, funding fixed capacity. This is great to see. Rather than throwing work over the fence to the development teams and then the development teams throwing work on, uh, over the fence to the uh, operations infrastructure teams. Reporting's changed. We're now reporting these flow metrics and, and how they're driving business outcomes. Did we get value to customers faster? Are we moving fast enough that we can actually adopt A-B testing for a value stream uh, 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 that's, that's got a customer-facing application. So actually understanding that flow, understanding how it's driving customer outcomes, such as uh, retention and ado adoption, net promoter scores and the like, has been a really important shift. Instead of just measuring activities and measuring are we on track for this thing, uh, are we, have, we, have we moved enough of our application portfolio to the cloud, instead we're actually looking at are we reaching those business outcomes? Are we accelerating flow? Do we have flow time, as, as I'll show you in a moment, that's fast enough to make sure that we're innovating uh, at the pace of our competitors or faster? And then there's this other interesting aspect, which is how it affects our organizational design. So that some of the principles of DevOps of providing teams with that autonomy, making sure that we can deploy easily and safe, safely are important, but those concepts of flow, feedback, and continual learning actually need to span the entire value stream. We, we can't stop at just uh, development and operations. We have to bring those concepts of DevOps end to end so that we can, again, make sure that we're innovating at the pace that, that our customers in the market expect. So at the core of all of this is the concept of, of these value streams. Value streams, we, we, we understand teams well. We understand how teams hand off uh, work between each other and, and how they work. But we need some concept at the team of teams level that, that's bigger than the team, that connects the customer, connects the business, whether it's an internal customer uh, who's, who's needing a, an internal system, or whether the customer's developers who need additional API or who do need additional changes to the, to the CI CD pipeline, or whether it's an external customer, someone benefiting directly and, and driving a, a financial business outcome. So one, the thing that we know about value streams now, as more and more organizations have adopted this, is those value streams need to be aligned to what the business is. They, they, they can't, and of course, some can be internal. APIs and platforms are, value streams are aligned to internal objectives that then drive external and customer facing objectives. They need to be autonomous in the sense that the faster the value stream can move to deliver value, the fewer dependencies it has, the more independence and autonomy has, the, the, the faster the flow. And I think there's been just a lot of great literature over the, over the past few years on how important this is. We know that value streams need to be cross-functional. To, to say that one team can do everything, that you can have this perfect cross-functional team is not realistic when we're building large-scale software. So in the end, we need teams of teams and we need that to, to span these value streams. And each one of them needs to be customer-centric. So we need to make sure that they know who their customer is, they're, they're connected to the customer, we're using methodologies to track outcomes for the customer, whether it's objectives and key results, OKRs, or, or something similar, that in addition to understanding the technology that's being delivered, understanding the roadmap and, and backlogs being delivered on, we actually understand how work is flowing to drive those outcomes, and of course the outcomes are specified, and they're specified for that customer, be they internal or external, a business partner and the like. However, some of the challenge that we're seeing is that, of course, this now has to span functions. As soon as you've got a cross-functional value streams that might involve designers, it might involve operations teams, multiple development teams, and the like, uh, you've got, you're spanning functions. You'll often be spanning hierarchies in the organization, sometimes be spanning geographies as well, and sourcing partners if, if, if you're using those for a portion of your development. 
So the thing that I've noticed right now in terms of the shift of project to product and how it overlaps with DevOps is a lot of organizations are, are struggling with this, this, this very messy matrix. They've adopted many of the practices around Agile and scaling Agile, many of the, of the modern practices around DevOps, but now we have to make those work for our organization. And what's really important is we have to understand, are things getting better in the way that we've structured these teams and the way that we've structured responsibilities and these lines of, of autonomy and accountability, or, or have we done something wrong? Uh, do we have a dependency that a team has? Have we neglected to train a team on a whole set of, of, of new cloud services they should be using? Have we provided the right kind of tooling, the right automation to make those teams productive, or, or are the value streams having to replicate a lot of that uh, themselves? So I think the key thing is th that, that is now happening is to, for us as leaders of, of our teams, of our organizations, of, of technology direction, is to understand how we can actually apply these, these core principles of DevOps, those things that uh, you, you may remember uh, Gene Kim uh, outlined in the Phoenix project of flow feedback and continual learning at an entire organization level, at the level of our whole technology organization. And so uh, Gene Kim and Steve Spear have been doing this some fascinating work around how that we can think about the, the structure and the dynamics of organizations. And so we'll relate some of that here. Uh, it's not entirely published yet, but, but uh, uh, you can follow them on, on LinkedIn and Twitter to, to learn what they're doing as, as they're learning through this process uh, and heading towards, towards uh, writing about this in, a, in an upcoming book. But I want to make sure to re relate this because I've realized that I've, I've, I found these concepts and these first principles very powerful in order to adapt that DevOps thinking to end-to-end -end organizational design, uh, to the way that we think about technology directions, and to really what we can impact as, as leaders at various levels in the organization. And so the idea is that as leaders, what we can do is we can configure the organization from a people and a functional and a, and a tooling point of view, and then we actually need to run that. So kind of like, kind of like software, and of course my background is all, all in building software, uh, what we're, what we're, we're configuring the organizational design, the, basically the communication lines, the collaboration architecture, how that interacts with the software architecture, and then we need to run it and see how it's working. So we've got that design step and then, and then this assessment step. And a core part of this, of course, is providing that, that kind of automation, those handoffs, that ownership. Uh, let's say if, if you build it, you own it to your teams, and understanding is that working or did we miss something? So for that design, we actually need some kind of toolkit. We need to apply these things that we know work in terms of enabling flow, uh, and just to be able to talk to our teams, to evolve our organization, to match the same kind of, let's say, cloud transformation, agile transformation that we're putting in place. So we need these kinds of pattern languages for how we think about organizations from a technology point of view. I think the good thing is there's been a lot of uh, progress made on this as well. For example, books like Team Topologies introduced this. We've got single-threaded ownership uh, that you might know from Amazon or from other organizations. Uh, but we've got these pattern languages that help us understand how to effectively structure and shape teams. Uh, and then we actually have to under assess, are we, did we improve things? Did we make them better? Or did we slow them down? And this is where I'll show you how the flow framework and measuring and managing flow can be this really powerful tool to understand, are we actually getting closer to the, the, the three ways of DevOps? Or did we do something inadvertently to actually slow our organization, our teams down? And so the core principles, again, here channeling uh, Gene Kim and Steve Spears are this notion of structure. We're able to design this organizational structure. And part of that's the org chart, part of that ma the matrix, part of that is actually how uh, the, the, the technical parts, the software architecture, the infrastructure, how all of that overlaps with the teams, and then to actually understand the dynamics. So what we ended up with in terms of the dynamics of how we're delivering value, what kinds of meetings, what kinds of approvals are needed to actually deli deliver software and value, how are those dynamics working? So we, we're constantly to evaluate, are we improving flow or did we imp impede the flow? And always, where is the bottleneck to that flow? Because fundamentally, every system that we create, and these are very complex systems when we think about our whole technology landscape or organization, every system has a bottleneck. And the more that we can focus on, on uh, relieving the bottleneck, the more value we deliver, the better the outcomes, and the happier our staff and our customers. So the idea here is, of course, that you've got these, these ways of designing. This is Safe, Scrum, Spotify, all these various models for doing this, team topologies, STO, and the like. And then you can use the flow framework for assessing, for assessing the organization. Again, did we improve? Did we slow down? So I'll give you a really kind of quick crash course in, in measuring and managing flow. And of course, the key thing to keep in mind is, these flow metrics give us a sense of, of are things improving or are things not improving? Uh, and are, are they driving these business outcomes? In the end, this, is, this truly is about business and customer's outcomes as expressed here in terms of you know, some kind of value metric. This might be revenue, profitability, retention numbers, um, 
a cost metric. Every value stream has a cost. And of course, what we're trying to do is make sure that for the cost, we're actually excelling value delivery, quality, and happiness. The, the better a job that we do of aligning our software architecture, our organizational design, um, uh, with our business value streams, what we're trying to deliver to the customer, that the happier the staff are. One thing we commonly see uh, when we measure an organization's flow and we, when we measure some of these business outcomes is actually the, the faster the flow velocity, and I'll define that in, in just a moment, uh, the happier the staff working on the value stream. Because the way that you accelerate flow velocity is by removing burden from the teams, removing overload from the teams. So all of a sudden, Work gets easier to do, outcomes get easier to deliver, you've got more satisfaction from your work, and the happiness of the staff working on that, on that value stream improves. So I won't go into much depth on the flow framework, but the, the core concept is across the entire organization, across the value streams, we've got features, defects, risks, and debts. Those are the, basically every work item, every incident, every feature request, every, everything maps into those four. And in the end, we need to measure, is flow improving or is it slowing down across the value stream? So we've got features, that's net new business value, Defects, that's quality improvements, incidents, things that we're trying to make. Of course, those are all pulled by the customer. Risks, so the flow framework makes risks a first class part of software delivery, security, availability, compliance, uh, and then debts, technical debt, infrastructure debt, all of those sorts of things, organizational debt, in fact, as well, that we need to improve to accelerate flow elsewhere. And these flow items are mutually exclusive, they're MISI, mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive, which means if a value stream does more of one, it's doing less of another. Uh, if all of a sudden we have to put in the, do a whole bunch of compliance work because things are changing on that front, less feature work will, will get done. So we've got a way of looking at, okay, what's the distribution for this value stream of the flow items that we're working on, and then it's all around measuring flow. So just the same way that we need to measure the, the the health of our body, we need to be able to measure the health of every single value stream. Not because that health might be perfect, uh, and not because every value stream needs a super fast flow, but because we need to have a baseline and understand where to improve, and how our organizational design, our automation, our DevOps, our infrastructure efforts are actually helping on that front. Uh, so there are four flow metrics, and then there's flow distribution, which I'll talk about in a moment. Flow velocity is simply uh, how many flow items got done over a period of time. And so flow velocity is this very important metric that just tells us forgetting story points, forgetting the details of every uh, user story or issue or defect or incident, how, how much flow happened across that period of time, whether that was a sprint, that was a month, that was a fiscal year or a quarter, anything of that sort. Flow efficiency tells us where that work queues up. So wait states are, are, are the kiss of death. Basically, if work is queuing up, uh, it's taking bandwidth from people, it's, taking, it's putting cognitive load on our platform teams. Uh, it's actually, it's, it's wherever those queues are is where we need to look at. And flow efficiency tells us where are things waiting? Where, basically, where, where are we thrashing? Where are things impeding us from getting work done? Flow time is just the end-to-end -end time for delivering value. So the, the, but it's end-to-end. -end. It's not how long it took from code commit to code deploy. It's how long it took all the way from when work entered the value stream as a feature, from an OKR, from an incident, or, or, a, or, or a service request, to when we had running code. And then flow load is the amount of load on the value stream. So it's, it's a work in progress metric, but that spans teams and it says, and it shows how much load is on the team because of course we know as soon as flow load gets too high, velocity actually slows down and flow time gets longer uh, because we're overloading the teams and, and thrashing happens. And then flow distribution is simply that, that distribution of features, defects, risks, and debts. Where if you have, let's say, very fast moving uh, consumer facing applications, market facing applications, you want really fast feature flow to do A-B testing more infrastructure payment systems, maybe a slightly slower feature flow, but, but very fast flow for risk management and security in sense is, is key. So every value stream should have its flow tuned to the flow, the, the, the flow distribution needed for the business outcomes. And what's really important is that we're always improving these flow metrics. So that's really the, 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 the whole uh, goal of the flow framework is to make it easy for us to define and measure every single value streams without changing how the teams are working today, but to inform how we actually want to evolve our organization, evolve our roadmap of automation, uh, infrastructure and architecture improvements. And when we do this, you can see some fascinating results. So here's an example of an organization who realized that uh, self-service testing was their bottleneck. And of course, they've known this for a while, they've been talking about it for two years, but when they actually finally prioritized that, put a team on providing the, that self-service testing, and of course they had a lot of other great activities going on, what we can see here in their flow distribution, where the, the features are green, is all of a sudden that work unlocked all this capacity. 
So they're able to, their flow velocity for features tripled and quadrupled over time as that was no longer a bottleneck. And now, of course, another bottleneck would come. They put effort there as well. But the moment they did the backend self-service testing, they actually had hard data showing how much this accelerated, which then helps them prioritize uh, and fund additional initiatives of the sort because the story was very simple. By accelerating feature, basically unlocking 45% of capacity that was there, that wasn't really being applied because everything was getting stuck here, uh, they were able to actually pull ahead $150 million in their business cases in delivering on those roadmap items. So it's exactly the, the, the great thing about measuring flow in this way is it gives you this way of, of, of connecting investments in platforms and APIs and infrastructure and new services and cloud to business outcomes that, that are visible to the customer because all of a sudden, all that velocity unlocks everything. So fundamentally, I think that the, the key thing I want to get across is while we're focusing very much on, on, on DevOps automations, other efforts, organization structure, in the end, our number one job is, is just improving flow, is just making it easier for our teams to get work done. Uh, and to do that, we actually need to understand where is our bottleneck? What is slowing teams down? Where is we're queuing up? As you saw in that, so in that case, uh, the lack of self-service was, was that bottleneck. And of course, relieving that bottleneck that provides a very measurable outcome if you're measuring flow. And you know, to really look at this, we do have to channel the three of constraints, Goldrad and here, Gene again, that any improvement made beside the bottleneck is an illusion. So if, we're, if instead of doing the, that self-service, uh, implementation, there was something else done by I don't know, automating security scans or something of that sort, um, or, or license scanning, that actually wouldn't have relieved the teams in that same way, that wouldn't have driven the great outcomes, and then of course the, the, the great satisfaction for the teams of being able to get, work, get their work done much more easily. So the key thing is we always need to understand and, and to measure flow. If we take this overly kind of top-down approach, and this is, this is the, the, the challenge that a lot of organizations are having of trying to adopt these faster, nimbler practices, but the teams are st still being micromanaged uh, with deliverable, basically with dates. We basically have kind of waterfall management processes uh, around the teams while we have um, the, you know, DevOps and Agile underneath and modern technologies underneath. We end up seeing value streams basically getting crammed with work. We end up seeing with those dysfunctions that you saw earlier, 20% of features being canceled and features being constantly accelerated and prioritized and so on. And this is actually the number one problem that we're seeing across large enterprises, is that value streams are completely overloaded because we're not applying those principles of DevOps in the way that we plan and structure and prioritize work across the organization. So instead, the idea here is, and this whole approach is, that we do still need plans, we still need good business outcomes. Approaches like OKRs are, are great at actually filtering and cascading those down to teams, but in the end, we need to measure flow, and we need to surface those bottlenecks. We need to understand and prioritize at a business, at a whole company level, are we improving or are we getting slower? Uh, and how do we actually get faster? How do we make it easier to do work? And to do that, you actually have to prioritize learning and improvement the same way that you prioritize day-to-day -day work. So I'll give a really quick example of an insurance organization. They actually are using the OKR methodology. And of course, they've got these great key results, this aspirational uh, objective of becoming the most innovative insurance insurer in their industry. And to do that, they want to make it reduce the time in half for how long it takes uh, their customers to provision an insurance policy. That's great. It's a kind of a, a, a great thing to drive for. But the really great thing that they did at this entire line of business level is to say, we actually want to drive a 10% flow efficiency improvement. They, they had a really significant shift of cloud going on. Um, and to do that, they actually needed to, they realized that they needed to not just focus on the next thing they need to get done, but they need to make it easier to get work done, to really leverage their, their cloud and hybrid environments that they were investing significantly in. So, in terms of the mobile application supporting this, uh, that particular value stream, that value stream said, OK, well, to, to, to really become so innovative and make it easier, we have to improve our mobile experience. And we're going to measure that with a 20% NPS, net promoter score improvement. Uh, but the really cool thing that they did is they said, OK, well, that's, that means that we can't just keep, keep working as we are today. We actually need to leverage these new technologies, this new infrastructure that we have to deliver things faster. Because we know the only way to actually have happier customers of our, of our mobile applications is if they're getting more of the features they love and it's looking and feeling more modern. And so here was the interesting thing. Because of that top level company goal of improving flow or line of business goal of improving flow, um, there were already flow efficiency uh, experiments in, in, in progress. And they keep in mind, they, they actually have a modern infrastructure in place. They've been on that journey for a while. Uh, and it, 
looks like it's actually not that, that infrastructure that's any of the problems. Their DevOps practices were good. Uh, verification of the features they're delivering was their bottleneck. So the team all of a sudden starts targeting a zero days wait state on business input. So they say, this is what we're going to do. It's aspirational, of course. It ended up being more than zero days. But the effect was just incredible because what happened is if we, if we look at their flow metrics, uh, they went from a flow time for features for nearly, for, of nearly 30 days to basically overnight in the course of a single sprint of making this, this simple process change to under 10 days. So all of a sudden, you're, you're, you're going two thirds faster in delivering those features. The great thing about that, of course, is then that, that was the leading indicator. They started being able to move faster. The lagging indicator in this case was, was the business outcome thereafter, which is customers are happier, net promoter score is going up. Uh, and all of a sudden, they're actually leveraging all of that uh, cloud infrastructure that they created to drive customer outcomes, whereas before they were stuck because the business, they had moved fast, they moved to the new platforms, but the business was, was much slower to adapt. And they still had these effectively quarterly cycles or monthly cycles of approving work done by this team. So it's again, this is, this is just such a great example of how we can elevate these principles of DevOps, not to be stuck at the, at the development of the team level, but to really change how the business is thinking. And the way to do that, of course, is through data. So we can actually move things this much faster, drive this business outcome, if we just change how we're looking at, in this case, approving things or UAT or whatever the bottleneck may be. Uh, and of course, the same kind of thinking can be used to, to, further, in, create, uh, to further invest in platform investment investments. So in this case, kind of the, the same team was leveraging, there's been too much lifting and shifting done, by the way, in this organization and how they were moving to cloud. Uh, there was a significant cost bubble that was happening that people started complaining about and that finance started getting worried about. And so the, the platform teams actually said, okay, hang on, we've lifted and shifted too much. We have all these services, these data storage services, they're much more efficient that we can use. We've not had a moment to be able to use them because we've been focused so much on moving the, uh, the application portfolio. Uh, and so just give us a quarter to actually move some of the things to the new storage services. And so they did that. They focused their flow, of, <coughs> their flow <coughs> excuse me, their flow distribution on debt reduction, adopting those new services, and their storage, their, their cost bubble actually went down by 75% because all of a sudden they were actually using uh, modern storage services and they were able to celebrate this. That's a very significant thing and it actually helped validate that, that this approach, this, this uh, more modern approach actually had a much better cost profile as long as the teams were given the chance to adopt these new, new services. So really the whole goal here is that we, you know, we understand flow the same way that we understand it in, in a, on, a, on a map and on a traffic diagram. Where's the bottleneck? These bottlenecks, by the way, uh, it's, it, it does become, after, as, as you get better and better, better at the organization, it does become whack-a-mole, right? At first it'll be self-service. And then it'll actually go back to being another part of the pipeline that should have been automated. And they'll come back to the dependency on a platform team that's actually been understaffed. Uh, and and the, the key thing is that we're actually seeing this picture and we're seeing it whenever we're doing planning and whenever we're doing prioritization so we know where to invest. We know, for example, that we might need to move this agile team uh, to a platform area because we're never gonna make our goals in the mobile portfolio without putting more, actually more torque on the backend platforms as is so often the case in terms of, in terms of what we see. So again, and starting to wrap up now, the whole goal here is that you operationalize measuring and managing your flow as part of your DevOps transformation, as part of your cloud transformation, as part of moving to, to more modern infrastructure approaches and modernizing your, your software portfolio or as part of any reorg that you do. And you start measuring flow now. The, 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 basically, the, the flow distributions, the value streams, they're all there today. We just need to be able to layer onto them, measure them without disrupting the way the teams work, and then use that to, to guide, in the end, our investment in digital transformation where we focus next, uh, how we accelerate. Once you do that, the, the results can be amazing. And some of those success stories, we see this across the industry. Uh, the, the teams are celebrating, finance is celebrating, and everybody's happy. And really underneath all this is, is, is a significant mindset change uh, that, uh, again, coming back here to the, to the core DevOps principles of the Phoenix Project, that improving daily work is even more important than daily work. And of course, what's happening is as we're modernizing our application portfolios, trying to build more new applications, launch new initiatives and new products, uh, there's such a big focus on just getting that work done that results in overload, that results in underinvestment in platforms, that results in too much tech debt. And so you have to operationalize and systematize improvement of daily work and, of course, measure it. Did we accelerate flow? Did we make things easier for our teams? Did flow improve? Or did it get worse? Do we need to focus elsewhere? And that's really the whole goal of this shift from project to product and the flow framework. So 
For learning more, uh, you can go, we have a lot of open resources, free resources. There's, of course, the book, um, but the Flow Institute has a, there's a community, a Slack community you can chat with there. Uh, you can get additional materials and really help yourself and your teams understand how to measure and manage flow. And uh, feel free to reach out to me on, on, any, of these, on any of these channels. And um, I'm happy to say that all author proceeds of the book go to a charitable program supporting women and minorities technology as well. So it's, it's been great. We've been able to create some scholarships out of this, which is just wonderful as we see more and more of the industry adopt this shift from project to product and to measuring and managing flow. So with that, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference.